Um, so let's dive into the slides. Um, what do I have for slides? Um, basically, the idea tonight is to share some tech tips, tech tips that will, especially those that are going to be helpful to nonprofits. And when we run out of those, also like toss some questions out there. We're going to have time for that, I think, as well. But I want to start off by sharing my favorite new piece of technology for uh, nonprofits is Canva. And it's one where I've, even though I've been aware of it for a year and a half, close to two years, I really have gotten to see the power of it this year. I first became acquainted with it for building my business cards. And it was really easy to go online. They have these lovely free templates that make it really easy and quick to design beautiful business cards and get them printed for a really nice price. Like at least it used to be crazy expensive to get the bleed on there and everything. And they make it super easy. Free graphics if you want those and logos that you can put into there and the layouts all really easily. It's also a great tool for it. nice clean graphics. And I'll show you some examples here in a second as well as stock photo photos. They have a lovely bank of stock photos which makes it and they're, for free, they're available for free. And so it's wonderful to be able to plug those into social media or into your website or other places. And so it's a tool that we have used quite a bit for my side gig. I told you that by day I'm a consultant. By night, I have this other project with a friend to help nonprofits find the right consultant. It's called Philanthroforce. And so we used Canva to build all the graphics that we've put up onto social media. Like made it really quick to put all the pieces together and make it look really good. We had an intern do that for us. And we had an intern do this one as well. And it's like really nice looking graphic and all built inside of Canva. Um, and so you really, I, what I've seen is you don't really need to have a high level of technical expertise like you used to with a lot of these tools. And in fact, I have a colleague who on the spectrum of kind of tech ability, she's kind of over on the AOL side of the spectrum in terms of like tech knowledge. And she's able to use Canva and do really pretty graphics with it um, and make things come out looking really nice, including like for a presentation that we did on here on TechSoup a month or two ago. So that is the one of the, that, that's my new thing for this year. So I'm gonna turn off the, the slide share and open it up. I do have some backup slides just in case nobody wants to talk, but what do you guys have? Who has, who has a, a tip that they'd like to share with the group? A neat tool for, for nonprofits to use. I'll go first. Uh, this is Kyle again. So I haven't really used it much, um, but I've read a lot about it and I've seen it kind of in these same type of discussions where folks are looking to create some apps um, with kind of like no code experience. So there's a platform called AppSheet, A-P-P-S-H-E-E-T. Um, like I said, I've heard a lot of great things about it and it seems to be a no coding type platform where you can get an idea out quickly and into iOS and Android world. So that might be beneficial to folks looking to have a presence in the app stores. And so Kyle, for, for those of us who've never built an app before, like what, what kind of thing might somebody who doesn't have a high level of, of, of uh, expertise with this, what kind of thing might somebody put together? Um, like a, uh, a, an inventory list. So maybe you're building like a, a, some type of punch list that a contractor has to go through and, and do to you know, fix up a house to get ready to show or something like that. So maybe you are really good at creating these lists, but not a lot of skill at programming. From what it looks like, this type of tool could help you take some list type item and turn into an app pretty quickly, just from like, forms or Excel, something like that. So if I was like a Habitat for Humanity and we had volunteers, right? And they have these assigned roles and we could say, all right, yeah, you're in role A, get the role A checklist and basically work, yeah. work through that kind of deal. So they don't have to worry about the pencil and paper kind of deal. Okay, yeah. cool. But I imagine there are probably about a thousand different kinds of things somebody could build is kind of is it one of those kind of sky's the limit and just depends on your creativity kind of deal like i said it, when we were talking about what could people get into that's kind of easy 
that's the first thing that came to mind. I was just reading about the other day. I haven't used it a lot myself, but um, it looks pretty cool. I just pulled right. it up, kind of skimming through it. Cool. Thank you. Who else has run into some technology that they have found is really useful, making the work easier? Alan, I see your hands up. Hi. Um, I guess we signed up. Uh, we were using Google Workspace, I guess, with a nonprofit. You get to Google Workspace, and then we found that there was they give you ten thousand dollars a month for Google Ads. So that's kind of you know we were like, oh, that's wonderful, but. How, how does this work? <laughs> how do you figure out where do you put it all together? But we found a group out of uh, a university in Pennsylvania and Philadelphia. And for these college kids to graduate, they have to implement this for you and get a certificate in Google. And so that program is out there. I mean, I know you finally people get these 10,000, you don't know what to do with them. So we did it and these uh, college students- I found these results. Sorry about that. These college students set it all up and we were receiving, uh, I mean, it was just, it got really busy, like thousands of people just visiting the website. And so uh, that particular, we weren't even ready for that. You know, we're just kind of like, okay, now we know what it can do. Let's just pause it. But that's out there. Um, I think if you look for ad, Google ads and stuff and kind of a win-win these college students get to get a certificate you get to set up your 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 ad ads out in google and so forth so that's yeah. super cool if you were able to dig up the link to that program i would love to share that widely because it's the number one request i get all the time locally okay let me find it thank you thanks thank you alan who else has a, a tech tip that maybe that's saved their bacon over the past year or two or something that's really exciting and uh, kind of like Kyle, like I haven't, haven't tried this yet, but I can't wait to try it. I think I've got something I'd like to share. Um, so I have to deal with all sorts of video in my life because uh, what happens is, of course, you know, you do a webinar, then they're like, edit that webinar, find the clip in the webinar. Where is that section there? And editing video is is a nightmare. Um, but there is this new tool called Descript. And what it does is it does a like a transcription of your video, um, which lots of things do at this point. But what it does is it then takes this text transcript and it ties it directly to the video. So if you cut a bit of, of copy from the script, it edits your video in place. So this is really quite powerful. So you'll say, so here's my video. And as I click through here, it will, it'll start showing like, here's what that section looks like um, in the video itself. So you could either scrub through the video or scrub through the script. And if you're like, oh, that's great, but actually I don't want that intro sentence. You just highlight that text, click delete, and it, gets, it cuts it all out from the video. Um, so that can be really powerful. The other, very crazy thing it does is it's got these tools here. So you can basically say like, I wanna shorten all word gaps. Like, oh, there was a part section, like a couple of places where there was like a, a half second gap. And so you can go through here and just say like, find me any word gap that's over you'll see here on the right over a minute. And, uh, and then just like, like shrink it down to maybe a half second. So you can start, you know, doing these, these mass edits across it. You can also do the same thing with this filler word thing. So you do the same thing where it would go through the script and say, find me any instance of um through the whole script. And then you just say like either show all of them or click a button and just delete all of them. And so it gives you a really quick and dirty way to not create a perfect edit that you would be able to do with like, you know, in a more professional setting. But if you just need to do a good enough, quick and dirty edit, this is a really powerful tool. It's also great for those social media sharing moments where you are looking for like, you know, the, someone says something really insightful, one great sentence in the middle of a webinar or something like that. You can just go find that text, highlight it here in the text, and then just say, what, just make a copy it to a new clip. Um, and so then you could basically go and ex export that as like a three second video. So that's uh, Descript. 
I think it's super handy. There is a 50% nonprofit discount. Otherwise, it's about 10 bucks a month. And if you do this kind of stuff like I do fairly often, it is a real lifesaver. How fun, Eli. Thank you. Thank you. When, it make, when you make the ums go away, does it like make that part of the video go away too? Or is it just pulling them out of the transcript? You get an option. So yes, yeah, so you can either say, remove all of those and just mute that, but don't like cut the video. Or you can also say, and cut the video at each one of those points as well. Oh boy. So you can get rid of those kind of embarrassing gifts and uh, yeah. that person who's supposed to sound so articulate and polished, like you could make them maybe sound a little bit more articulate and polished than they really were. Absolutely. Like, so in the, you know, the professional radio world, the NPR people will do that. If you've ever, you know, been interviewed on the radio and then listen back later, you're like, I'm not that articulate. I pause way more than that, but they've gone through <laughs> and done that kind of tight edit to what you've done. And that, used to be a team of interns and transcripts. It's like, you know, they were editing actual physical tape, a really difficult job, but now you can just edit the text and it just edits the video as well, which is quite powerful or the audio. Some people just use this as just a podcast creation tool as well. So that's pretty nifty there. The last thing which is nifty, but starts getting a little bit creepy and we started hearing about this recently is you can also create fake robot voices. So if you feed enough of yourself or another guest presenter into the system, and then you're like, oh, what they really should have said in that sentence was, I am a nonprofit staffer instead of, no, me am staffer. Well, you could just go there and write that into the text and it will then create that audio in the video. Now it's not gonna be 100% perfect, but who's looking at webinar videos that closely anyways. So that's something that's possible. You may want to be more cautious with that, but it is now a technical possibility um, as we're going to see to our horror in the political world very soon. Yeah, all of a sudden podcasts are going to be, um, yeah, very different. Um, somebody's hand I saw go up, but I didn't get to see whose it was. It was superimposed on Eli's screen. If there's somebody who wants to jump in with a, a, a follow-up question for Eli, Let's do that first, and then we'll take a, a new comment. Was there somebody who wanted to follow up on Eli? I think that is Eli Sand. Yeah, it was indeed my hand. Oh, oh, okay, okay. Well, cool then. But who has a, a comment or question? Who wants to go next? Jump in. This might be a stretch, but in in the interest of playing along, I'll throw out um, WordPress. My favorite of the, you know, open source content management systems. Um, if you ever find anyone who's looking for a fast website and needs it to be easy to manage on the back end, that happens to be my favorite of them. And I don't know if nodding or thumbs up, maybe everybody knows WordPress already in my world that, you know, this would have been news 10 years ago, but um, I have been helping a friend set up a store. There is a, a big, huge, popular plugin called WooCommerce that everybody uses for e-commerce, also free. Um, you know, you pay a few bucks for the payment processing, but in their case, they don't need it. Um, but if you have a friend or a coworker or, you know, someone who's looking for fast, simple websites, um, I, I always steer everybody to WordPress, wordpress.com. You set up a free account and you have a, a website, you know, at a wordpress.com address pretty quickly. Um, and then you can always apply your own domain to it and attach it to your email and, you know, make it cooler and smarter from there. So it's WordPress and, and WooCommerce, which is a new tool to me, but um, I've been impressed with just how easy they make it to pick up. And again, you know, you get something up quickly, and then you can always improve upon it with iteration. Adam, do you have opinions on uh, WordPress, or, may, or if not, you maybe somebody does WordPress versus something like Squarespace? You know, I I used to be snobby about steering everyone to WordPress, and and years ago I came to appreciate that what matters most is the people in charge of keeping the site up to date are comfortable in the administration console. 
Um, so I actually think Squarespace is a perfectly excellent option for a lot of people. Um, I have recommended to friends that they set up free trial accounts in both. Um, and of course, those aren't the only two players, but you know, it, it, it's, uh, it takes an hour or two to just try it for free. Um, and usually, you know, whether it reminds them of something or, you know, there's some, some association usually that makes them feel like this is the one for me and, and that's all it takes to be off and running. I'd be interested if anybody else has an opinion on the matter. Me too. Who else has an opinion? Squarespace versus WordPress versus any of the other ones out there that fall into the bas basket of uh, supposed to be easy to use. I think Wix also has that um, reputation. Eli, your hands up. Oh, is it? Oh, gosh. I guess I don't even know how to keep it down anymore. Um, <laughs> how do I hit that button again? Um, I don't have any strong opinions. The, the only thing I ever coach people on is basically saying, where is it something that you can easily export everything from? Do you ultimately own that data and control that data? Or is it something that's stuck in a platform and actually really hard to get out? And you're going to have someone cutting and pasting in five years. Um, otherwise, yeah, tools are tools. When if you like it, go for it. Oh, and Alan, did you raise your hand? Did you have a comment on it? Uh, yes, uh, we did just a very basic Google Sites. Uh, we do therapies in VR, but mostly for a mobile VR model. Um, that particular nonprofit started in refugee camps, so it's very. We wanted something very simple and that can be translated into other languages kind of very automatically. And so using Google just, just made it part of that, made it very easy. So I just wanted to add that. But also uh, if you're looking for kind of low cost meeting things, um, Mozilla Hubs, we notice a lot of people turning that into businesses or using it for schools in VR. You can access it with uh, your your monitor, you can access it with your phone, you can access it in VR. But mostly for VR, I think you can have up to 25 people and have meetings in there and you can design the landscape. If you're a very good designer, you can have the landscape designed. Um, that's not what we do in therapies. We just do these little apps. You download them on your phone for free. And so we, we manufacture our headsets. So it's a different thing that we do. But Mozilla Hubs is out there. I know a lot of people do it great stuff with it if you want to have meetings and you could pop up stuff inside of there. Like if you want to put a video or an object in a meeting like this and it would just pop up on in front of everybody. Um, it's a little bit like WordPress. That's why I was bringing it up. Um, so I was just like WordPress of, for, for VR. Cool, thank you, thank you. I'm gonna, in response to, Adam, oh, Lad, hands up, go. Yeah, I have a have a suggestion. So there's a, a platform called Jitsi, J I T S I. That's a video app, video conferencing platform. It's a open source product. So it's an alternative to Zoom uh, that I wanted to throw out there for anyone that might just happen to want to not use the only video app anyone ever uses. <laughs> Uh, for some reason. Well, what's the user experience like with it? I, this is a new one for me. Yeah, it's pretty good. It's gotten a lot better over the years. Um, and that's the strength of open source projects too, is that it gets community input and support um, contributions. So yeah, it's, it's pretty slick. Um, I'm sure it doesn't have every feature Zoom has, but it, uh, Overall, it works quite well. And you can, uh, one advantage is uh, people can access it in their browser without having to download a separate app. Okay, so that, may, that makes it a whole lot easier to get somebody new to adopt it, right? Right, yeah, so that might, that might make it more accessible for some, uh, some users. Wonderful, wonderful. I've got a question I want to throw back at the, the rest of you. 
Um, so I have used a number of different tools over the years just for like screen casting, like basically screen recording. So I can say like, here's how I did this thing instead of having to write a five step like help document if I just show someone a quick video. What, what are the hot tools these days? How are people doing that kind of screen recording and sharing? Uh, this is Russell. Um, I'm not sure what the nonprofit price would be, but we use Camtasia on almost a daily, weekly basis. We find it's really easy. Uh, and we automate a lot of things, right? Instead of trying to show somebody, once we have a, from a tech perspective, we have somebody who comes in with a problem, for instance, and, and we'll just do a quick screen capture and it's with all the clicks and then you can do the voiceover at the same time or after. Um, and then it just goes up to screencast and we can share that link and it's, it's really easy to use, uh, pretty intuitive. You just start it and start clicking around. Um, and that's the one we've always used. And it's, um, you know, we, we found that to be really useful. So, and that's Camtasia, but I can't remember who the company is behind it. It's, um, but if you Google for Camtasia, C-A-M-T-A-S-I-A, -A -A, that'll get you. Yeah, I think I showed up from TechSmith, I believe is TechSmith. That, that, yep, TechSmith. Yeah. So. Yeah, no, I've used that in the past. I also liked it, it had some, a pretty good uh, like screen annotation tool built in as well, just to, like throw arrows and text on as well. Yeah, yeah. I'll add one to the mix. Um, it's called ShareX. You can get it from getsharex.com. It's, I think, free and they accept donations. It's pretty cool. And that's another screen capture tool? Yep, video screenshots. They have some editing. They have built in like hosting tools to send it to, you know, pick your site like Imager or anywhere else, Facebook probably. Oh, that looks really good. I'm currently using Snagit, but I'm paying them more money than I really like to. Um, so I'm going to look at that. And we're going to have to check both these out. I've been using Loom and enjoying it a whole lot. But uh, yeah, it's good to know more options. There's, a, there's, also, uh, there's also an app um, called GreenShot. I think you can download it as a desktop app. And it allows you to capture an image and do like annotation on it. Like if you wanted to, to you know, create nice uh, shapes, you know, let's say you're doing like a, like a how-to, you can like, you know, put a shape in there, symbols, um, save it, print it, you know, send it out, whatever. That's, that's a pretty nice one. It's called Green Shot. Yeah. Lovely. Yeah. Basically, they're the things that everyone's like, you're so impressive. That must have taken you hours to put this thing together for me. I'm like, no, 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 no. I spent, right. I spent seconds on you, but here's, here it is, you know, for just like a lot of internal support work. Um, these, I find these tools super valuable. Well, I can, I can share something that's kind of uh, not screenshot related, but um, uh, are you guys familiar with Trello at all? Trello, it's a, it's a project management tool. Um, I can show you a little bit here. I can share my screen for, uh, let's see if I have it up. I thought I had it. Okay, yeah. Okay, can you guys see it okay? Okay, so um, this is Trello. Um, I started actually looking for a, a I'm, I'm an IT manager, so I started looking for like a ticketing software. I really didn't find anything that I liked and, and I had heard about Trello, which is kind of an agile, I, I don't know if you're familiar with agile methodology, um, but this was something that's kind of related to that, uh, kind of in that same vein. And basically um, this is, not just for IT management, like this, I use it right now as a, as a support ticket management. Like if I get a ticket or, or um, like an IT task that I need to do, I'll, I'll enter it in here. And basically it allows you to create these, uh, these cards. And in these cards, you can create, uh, let's see, no, sorry, not cards. You uh, forgot the name and convention of it, but a table. And the table has a card and each card you create um, goes into that table. 
and you can actually drag and drop these cards into different tables. So if you can imagine, you can create, let's say you're managing multiple people, you can actually create um, a new card, a new list. No, never mind. Okay, my naming convention is off, but it's called a list. So I can add a list and say, this is, you know, John. And I, sh I can actually start dragging and dropping uh, things for John to do. So let's say, you know, I want to do, I want John to like, you know, configure cell phones. So I can drag it to his, his list. Um, so you can manage uh, tasks for different people in this way. Um, the way I'm using it is not really for that, although I, you know, I do see myself doing that eventually. Um, I do have actually something for Joshua here. So I'm kind of building a list for him to do. But the way I've used it, you know, I have like incoming things go into this list. And then when they're, when they're done, they go to the done list. And that's it, uh, you know. So it, it's kind of working with different um, items and being able to play around with them, putting them into different lists um, so that, you know, you can keep track of everything. Um, and each a uh, card that's in the list has a different, you can do different things with it. You can create a checklist within a card. Um, so I can add, you know, this checklist and I can actually start, you know, creating sub lists within each card. Um, and I can also, you know, create due dates for when those things will be due, stuff like that. Um, I mean, there's, there's multiple things that you can do with this. Um, I've even started doing, um, let's see, I have lists of lists. <laughs> so I created a list of you know, things to do for laptops, um, questions for people, things like that. Um, I've also created uh, long-term projects you know, that I can't do right away. So I started putting that in there. And, it's, it's very open-ended what you can do with it. It's just a great way to, you know, collect all the things that you need to do, organize them in the way that you want them to organize, uh, that you want to organize them and uh, keep track of, you know, their status and things like that. So something I'd, I'd really like to, to use and something I just recently discovered. I thought you guys might like that. Thank you, Jose. That got me thinking about at my, the last place I worked, there were a number of teams who were using Asana, which is a similar tool. Yeah. And um, they were especially, they found it to be especially valuable when you had, they had to have multiple people collaborating on the same project and they needed to have really good communication about where, you know, if, a, if this project had 20 different tasks, they needed to know who owns each task, mm -hmm. um, where are the different tasks in the process, and also to be able to visualize the dependencies, right? That B can't happen until A happens and A is waiting on Jose. And so, and it's Tuesday and it said it was supposed to be done Monday. Jose, help us out. What happened to task A, right? And so it helped them all stay on the same page about expectations and timing and all that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I think they're, they're uh, competitors in a way. Yeah, yeah. Al Alan, I saw you raise your hand. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jose, for sharing. I just found out about Trello. And uh, we brought on two UX designers for People's Budget Texas, and they wanted to do Slack. And I just can't stand that Slack thing. I, I every four years I am a field director for presidential candidates, and the last one that put in that Slack, it was just an echo chamber. It was a disaster. It's something I volunteer for every four years, but I can't stand that Slack. So we 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 came to a middle point of using Trello which is supposed to be public as well, so everybody can see it. But we're looking at it and how do we use it to, because we're building People's Budget Texas with five community colleges here in San Antonio, the Alamo Colleges, along with a couple other uh, IT volunteers. So it's kind of a community thing, but I just had to put the foot down on that slack. <laughs> I just can't. It just becomes an organism where it's this echo chamber going on. That's just like, so, but this Trello looks like a good little halfway 
uh, we'll figure it out. I don't know if it'll work, but thank you for sharing that. As it's it's something that we're going to put up now yeah, as a welcome. public thing. So a lot of the a lot of our people are politicians, city councilmen. They're not going to go into a, a, a Slack account, but if you can publicly see this Trello kind of a board, it's almost like a scoreboard of sorts, and see progress and be able to get updated, uh, then it it looks much more accessible. Mm -hmm. But yeah, thanks for sharing that. Sure thing. Folks, I have a question from a friend who wasn't able to be here tonight. I'm hoping you might have some answers for her. Um, she wanted to know what do people like for antivirus malware protection for a nonprofit, particularly on the free side, if possible. What well, what the, do we love? What do we hate for for that? Is, is this for uh, Windows or for Apple? Let's let's say Windows, but. Okay. Let's let's cover both while we're at it. Yeah. Well, Windows Windows has a built-in antivirus already, which is Defender. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's sufficient for viruses. Um, I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't see a need for antivirus outside of the, that Defender. I mean, maybe if anything, maybe like malware bytes. Um, you know, some. That's you know that's. Uh, I've used that in the past, but I think I think Defender should be sufficient. Anybody have any, any thoughts on that? Am I wrong? <laughs> I'd agree. I, I think that's a reasonable recommendation if budget is the you know top priority or one of them on the PC side. And malware bytes on the Mac side, I you know, I've heard good things about. Yeah, the uh, typically um I've run into a lot of computers where McAfee is pre-installed and uh, it's pretty annoying. So what I do, I just, I just delete it. <laughs> I just delete McAfee. I don't think it's needed, um, but you know, I, you know, they make it seem like it's, it's uh, urgent to have that software, but I, I you know, I, I just don't see the need for it. That's my take. Who else yeah. has an opinion? Go ahead. Uh, this is this is Russell, and I think in the introduction I said I've been in cybersecurity for 25 years, and um, um, it depends on your budget. Um, I mean, Bitdefender, we found Bitdefender and Malwarebytes to be uh, pretty good, and they'll work on Windows or Mac. Um, so it's, it's one thing you want to look at when you when you're doing something around there. You're going to want to manage it, right? So somebody's going to be managing it. You just want to put it on somebody's desktop and leave it up to them. And, and so you can buy some fairly low cost things. SOFOS has this fairly low cost as well. And you can imagine it, manage it from like an SMB, small business type dashboard. And then it tells you if people are up to date or not, you can look really quickly. If you just use like the Windows Defender, which to be honest, I don't think is, I think the, the, the the paid for ones or the free for nonprofit ones are, are gonna be better, but you're gonna be able to manage it across platform. Um, on that. And then if you have any Linux or anything in your, you know, in your environment for some reason, then a lot of people would, you, you definitely going to need something around there. But um, I would always kind of choose something that you're going to be able to manage. It's not so much does it just work, but if you got two different things on, on one on Mac and one on, on Windows, it's, it's never going to be really cohesive on there. So I would just, I would say use something that you can have a common dashboard for. Uh, and monitor and then give you alerts right on that as well in terms of who's out of date or, you know, are, are they doing scans regularly, right? Um, you can force scans with some of these SMB things, right? You want to be able to, you want to be able to monitor it, right? Just, just sticking it on and leaving it to people's own devices, I think is a recipe for disaster. That, you know, that brings up an interesting thing and i've experienced this in, with some organizations where they've never they, they've just macgyvered their whole tech setup and so you know everybody has these individual computers they're not networked or anything like it at all is is there a way to diy yourself out of that situation and start to get networked and start to have that kind of hub there so you can manage the security on all the computers and things like that 
Well, I mean, you could use, I mean, if you took, if you took something like, like a bit defender or Sophos or something, they actually have everything from antivirus to, uh, you know, personal firewalls that are on there as well. And you can manage all of that. It's not necessarily that they're, that they're networked together in that sense. Um, um, on that, they're, they're not part of a directory structure. That would be a totally different thing if you put somebody as part of your Windows directory structure. So if you're managing it from an active directory point of view, but if you just have people scattered everywhere, uh, I would, if you put, if you worried about viruses and phishing and, and malware, the easiest thing would be to find something you're comfortable with, with the dashboard that's inexpensive, get it installed on all of those machines. Um, and it also depends, do you have control of those machines? Are they your machines or are they volunteers machines, right? If it's a volunteers machine, you can't put your stuff on it and manage it. So, uh, if you're now connected to your network, that's you know that's a that's that's a whole different thing. But you can kind of manage it. If let's like just say you use Sophos, because I actually use that for my just my home and all my kids, so I can make sure everybody's updating stuff. Um, I can see if they're all updated. I can see if they're online. Some of it even has go find your your laptop features on it, um, um, and it's pretty inexpensive, you know. So. I want. I wanted to take uh, get your take, Russell, on you know the the advent of, of cloud computing, and it, it from from my perspective, it seems that since more apps are being utilized from the cloud, that there's less. I mean, you always want to be careful, but there's less of a, you know, if your computer gets a virus, it's not as critical because most you know most of the time you'll be working with cloud apps anyway. I mean, you should definitely have antivirus. I'm not saying you shouldn't, yeah. but it's not as critical as it used to be. Is, uh, that the, I, is that true? I would completely disagree with that because if somebody clicks on a link or they, they get malware or they get ransomware, you do that, you know, you do that by clicking on a link, right? It's, it's irregardless. And, and if they lock up all of, you know, and then as soon as you email somebody else, uh, they can click on a link. I mean, even... There's some scary stuff out there, not to scare everybody to death, but if you were to send somebody, a, if you had malware um, on your laptop um, and you were to send a link to 10 other people in your organization, uh, let's just say it's a link to CNN.com, it, it will dynamically change that link into a malware link and you will go to a malware site behind the scenes. So. I mean, there's a lot of stuff like that. So I would never, if, if I owned the laptops and they weren't volunteers' laptops, I would always have something up on it. Because um, ran ransomware right now is the biggest thing that we deal with. Um, now, obviously, we're we're talking to enterprise, you know, customers and things of that sort. But every, I mean, I've seen people, small organizations, as small as you know, ten people organizations get malware and just lock everything up and they can't do anything. You know, and they don't. These guys don't care if you're a nonprofit or not, you'll get a ransom demand for a small amount of Bitcoin and you got to pay it, you know, either that or you, you know, trash your laptops and start over. It didn't, you know, so. Now it does make it, if you, I mean, if you're all using something like Chromebooks that really didn't have that much of an operating system and you're all using cloud apps, that helps you out a little bit more. But if you're using email, you're, you're pretty much, going to be susceptible to it. So um, it just depends how large your, your organization is. And it, one thing you don't want to do is you don't want to accidentally send malware to a donor, a large organization that you're dealing with, things of that sort. Um, so yeah, it's not just your organization. You can spread it. That's the thing. So. Thank you. Yeah. Very good, very good. There are so many different aspects of technology and how it impacts our, our nonprofits. And I love how we're covering a lot of very diverse ground in terms of all the different pieces of um, technology. And it's one of the reasons I've become a big believer in having managed IT, right? Where I've encountered so many nonprofits where it's, it's a DIY MacGyver job, even nonprofits as big as like 20 staff or more. And it's, I've seen how transformative it can be to have an IT professional or ideally a team of professionals that you can call on when you need them. 
Yeah. So, well, one thing I would, would suggest, and I see this in the commercial space, not necessarily the nonprofit space, but I think nonprofit space would should do the same thing is almost nobody has their own IT anymore. Nobody manages their own IT. If you're an organization of 100 people or less, nobody has their own IT department generally. I mean, they'll have maybe one IT person there to kind of manage everything from an inside point of view, but they're, everybody's using a managed service or, or outsourcing it so that people are looking after their updates and their security and so forth. I think the thing would be to find out organizations that provide those types of services that may provide them at a reduced cost for, for nonprofits because, you, you know, you're, you're kind of one IT guy swimming in everything, right? And you can't know everything of, you know, about it. And so it's, I would, I would outsource that. We do that. I mean, I work for, I work for a cybersecurity startup and we don't do any of our own IT. It's all outsourced. We don't touch it because that's not our core business. We develop, you know, products. We don't do networking and, and IT and stuff of that sort. So. So it, 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 I think I'm hearing you echo something that I've, I've, been suspecting for a while, Russell, which is that one person cannot do it all anymore and probably hasn't been able to for a long time. That's correct, yeah. You may need that one person to help coordinate everything inside, but you really, it really pays dividends. You know, I guess it goes back to budget though, but I, I would, I would outs, I would never try to do it myself ever again. Yeah, no, it can be very expensive to DIY, right? And then you get hit with the ransomware because you were worried about some other thing and you weren't able to step on the developments and something yeah. else that was also important. Right. Cool. I think we have time for maybe one more. Eli, do we have time for one more question or do we need to? Uh, your microphone. I don't think we have a hard end on this. So uh, yeah, keep going until you run out. OK. Well, folks, why don't we do? Does anybody else have a burning thing that they want to contribute to the conversation or a burning question that they want to get the group's wisdom on? Uh, just briefly, I wanted to mention about the point about Slack versus something like Trello. Uh, in my opinion, they're complementary tools. They serve different purposes. I would not use Slack for project management, um, but Slack is useful for communication, but you need a permanent store for the things you're talking about because Slack will just keep scrolling by and the content is going to get lost, but it's helpful to have a quick way to bounce ideas around. So, And I wanted to mention on the topic of security, um, password management. Um, and maybe maybe others have have ideas. I I'm using one password right now. I know LastPass is popular, but um, in terms of a, in a nonprofit setting, does anyone have experience with what works well? Uh, I've got experience with one pass, um, and pretty much everybody that I know and kind of my cybersecurity buddies are all kind of default at the one pass for, for personal use and things like that. There's other things for enterprise use, but yeah, so I would, I would echo one pass as something that would, it's, I would definitely push and use. But. I guess in this context, it would be cool if there was an enterprise solution that had a nonprofit discount. Yeah, I haven't seen anything that really fits that at that sort of need at the sort of last passy kind of end user level. Um, on the other side, for enterprise with a nonprofit uh, access, there is, I think, up to maybe, I think about 50 users. So for like up to mid-sized organizations, Okta has got a good support option at quite a low cost, I believe, for nonprofits. It's obviously a slightly different thing. It's more single sign-on, but it's another way to sort of help an organization manage security, identity, and all that. Yeah, I, we've used Okta too. I'm, I'm familiar with those. The problem is something like Okta. That's you, you got to. You're getting into the realm of a lot of people who are cobbling together their IT um, are won't really be able to use it because it, it is a little complex when you're putting in a single sign-on versus just password management. So that kind of gets back to reasons why you might want to outsource some of that to a managed service provider. I, I use Dashlane. Password management, it's pretty good. 
And actually, this is my ignorance. I work at TechSoup. I did not know they're in the TechSoup catalog, but actually they you. are. Um, so thanks, Kyle. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, nice yeah, work. Just to add on to the TechSoup guy something. Just to add on to the security side too, talking about antivirus, a lot of it starts with safe browsing. So anybody that has like recommendations for you know good browser extensions like HTTPS everywhere for Google Chrome, those kind of tools are really helpful to keep people on the right path when they're using the internet that don't know better. Um, just food for thought. What was that one again, Kyle? HTTPS everywhere. So like if there was a site that was trying to pose as somebody else's site that was running on, you know, not securely so they could capture username and passwords off of forms that are unencrypted, uh, this particular tool would force your traffic over HTTPS or prevent you from operating on that site altogether. Um, th these are kind of things that people really don't see behind the scenes, um, but those type of extensions can help you know, save you. So perfect for like my 76 year old mother and or people whose browsing skills are at the same level as my exactly. mother's. Yep. And most organizations have a number of people like that. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Any other uh, hot tips before we wrap up for the evening? Or burning questions? When's the next meeting? Uh, November, first Monday in November. Oh. And my friend Tristan Pierce is going to be presenting on how to build an awesome QuickBooks stack. Basically how to leverage your, your basic nonprofit accounting package. Cool. Looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah. Tristan's a, a good guy. He knows this stuff really well. All right. Well, folks, thank you for joining us tonight. This has been... We did this one a year and a half ago, and uh, I think we covered two or three times as much ground tonight. This was really neat. I think we went deep and broad. I have personally a bunch of pages of notes. So thank you everybody for coming on and, and sharing your um, ideas and your experience. This has been yeah certainly a very fruitful one. I think this will be a good one for anybody who's watching this in video later. Be sure to get the chat because there were a couple of thoughtful people tonight who were dropping every time somebody mentioned a product that somebody was dropping into the chat, the URL to actually go there and, and check it out. So if, if you're if you're seeing this on video later, be sure to get, get the chat as well. And thank you to those of you who were dropping those things into the chat box for us. Eli, any parting words? Uh, nope. Uh, how about you're all great. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise. I learned a lot. Thank you. And uh, we hope to see you next time. All right. Thanks, guys. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys.